record. All right, so talking to me here this afternoon and I guess evening, depending on where you are in the globe, we have Yuma's mayor here, man of the hour kind of mayor. You guys have been dealing with uh, quite a big issue down there. Go ahead and introduce yourself for us. Well, I'm Doug Nichols, the mayor of the city of Yuma. I've been mayor eight years, uh, grew up in Yuma, it's my hometown. Um, left for a little bit, came back because I loved it so much and um, just trying to serve our, the people of Yuma in, in everything that we deal with from COVID to immigration to taxes. So you've seen a lot, you've seen a lot and you are a border community. It's, you know, what, what do you say to the people that, and I've, I've kind of used this analogy, what do you say to people that go, okay, but they signed up for it. This is what they signed up for. I mean, you're from there, you know all about this. This is a problem you guys are always deal with, right? Well, so these numbers are, are crazy numbers. Uh, yeah, we've had immigration issues um, and border crossing issues for, for years. That's true, but not at this, this level. We're on pace this year to be at a quarter million people crossing through this fiscal year. So if, to put that in perspective, last fiscal year, which was really about only 10 months of crossing people crossing, um, we hit 140,000 people. Well, that was just shy of the previous high, which was about 148, 150, somewhere in that range. And we did that in less than a full year. Well, the pace that we're kept now would be even 100,000 more than our previous high. So unless something dramatic happens, we're, that's, that's where we're headed. And it's basic, basic math and, and just looking at where we're at. So um, that's not normal for any border community, I think in any other country that had hundreds of thousands of people coming through one area and that those numbers just rep represent the Yuma sector for border patrol. Um, I think there'd be a national attention on how do you, how do you control that? How, how do you make sure that that's done uh, safely and that it's correctly done and protects the, the country that's being overran? Um, and that those discussions, you just aren't, aren't really happening at the level I would expect them to happen, mm -hmm. given like other countries that we we try to support. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you talk about those conversations. From what I understand, Secretary Mayorkas was in Yuma in the sector, to my knowledge, this week. Um, one of the border agents told me that he was in the sector yesterday. Is, is that something that you guys were able to communicate about? Was that something that you guys were able to kind of bounce some ideas? Hey, mm -hmm. I know the lay of this land, you know, what, what kind of conversations did you have? So uh, the border patrol agent had gave you a little bit of uh, misinformation. It was actually the new uh, CBP commissioner, Mangus from Tucson mm, that okay. was here. He's been on the job three weeks. Uh, so I'll give him a lot of credit for showing up here, uh, meeting with not just his agents and the people that work under him, but with community leaders from the sheriff to myself, to uh, one of our major nonprofits. Um, and he spent a lot of time listening and walking into that job. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you got to do a lot of listening, um, but he committed to continue to communicate. Um, and, uh, you know, he's an Arizona person, which is good for us, uh, but he's not from Yuma. So this was his first visit to understand the dynamics here because every border community is different uh, in, in their characteristics and their geography and their demographics. Yeah, you cannot take a paintbrush and just no. swipe it down the border and say, here's a fix, because, boy, I have learned from, from Yuma to Del Rio, you guys certainly have uh, your fair share of different issues. But with that being said, speaking of Del Rio, when I was down there and that state of emergency happened and the local mayor there had to enact their own local state of emergency and basically was was angry, was pounding the drum saying, hey, we've been asking for help since February. We've been reaching out since early December saying we saw this coming. We have been reaching out this week to our administration and we haven't heard anything. It took them a week just about to respond to Del Rio. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people were kind of precluding that Yuma was next. Yuma was the next Del Rio. And Sheriff Wilmot with Yuma County contacted me pretty much directly after I worked with Sheriff Joe Frank Martinez in Valverde, which is Del Rio. And he said, we're the next Del Rio by, by span, by per capita, kind of what you guys are dealing with versus what they're dealing with. He said, we're there, we're already dealing with this. And at one point there were, I believe 4,500 people up on Levy Road waiting. And I believe at that point is when um, you got involved and people started walking throughout the interior of Yuma. Let's right. talk a little bit about that local state of emergency mayor and where it stands right now. Well, I think part of uh, 
what people don't understand, and you've been on the border, so you understand it now, but um, as people come through, this is about like 90, 95% of the people want to turn themselves in because when the, once they get into the DHS process, they are exited with order to appear papers. In other words, giving them rights to live and work in the United States until their future court date, which could be three to five years down the road. So they want that piece of paper. So they come across the border and they look for the nearest border patrol agent to get the process started. Well, when that when there was 4,500 people in custody for border patrol, that was way over their capacity and they couldn't pick up at this regular interval that they had been. Mm -hmm. So people were waiting hours, over a day in some cases. And so they would um, instead walk to Yuma. So Yuma mm -hmm. is a border community, but it's not immediately adjacent to the border. It's a couple miles away. So they would progress into Yuma trying to find the border patrol station. Obviously they don't have resources. They don't know exactly where they're going. Um, the second day of that happening in increasing numbers, I thought, you know, we need to get ahead of this. Staying behind it is only going to lead us to humanitarian issues, potentially disaster crisis level uh, type of issues. We need to be out in front of it. So um, just as it did in 19, we prepared and issued a uh, declaration of emergency or proclamation of emergency. Um, which gives us the ability to access resources, but more importantly, elevates the discussion. Um, I did that day have a meeting with Secretary Mayorkas office, as well as some of the White House staff to talk through what was going on. And um, we talked about plans and, and things that were happening in, in motion. So um, it did provide that ability to have uh, the higher level discussions and really bring the attention here because we couldn't be another Del Rio. Um, and I'll give a lot of credit to the local border patrol. Uh, the chief here, Chief Clem, brought together all the, the agencies uh, in the community to talk about how are we going to respond? Should we get numbers at that level? So for Yuma, I think Del Rio was uh, 17,000 people in a month. Um, the size of Yuma is so much larger than Del Rio, that's up between 60 to 80,000 people in a month uh, uh, to come through here. We're not there yet. We're at 20 to 25,000 people a month, okay. which is a lot. Yeah. Um, and that's where we get up to the quarter million for a year. And I think it's important to say when those 4,500 people were there, it was also after a weekend, it wasn't 4,500 people walked together in a caravan and showed Correct. up in Yuma. I think those things are always important. Um, yeah. So with that local declaration that you made, um, did you, you were saying kind of get ahead of it. Did you see any impacts of those people in the interior of your community walking around? Did you see, I know the sheriff said they were inundated with calls. I mean, I was up at the border and had to call an ambulance for a young man mm -hmm. that was up at the border even. And so we're up at the wall. And so I know that those resources were pulled. Now, right. did that have any impacts on the local community? Um, fortunately, in those two days, and the third day after the emergency, it, it backed off to regular, which regular is only 950 people a day, um, which is still crazy numbers we've never seen before. Um, we didn't, fortunately, didn't have a whole lot of issues. It was just confusion, community confusion, not really what we ever see here. So by um, <laughs> making sure that we try to address things early. I had our, our police force just kind of tracking where people going so that they knew they, they, they weren't going to run into trouble, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Um, we were fortunate that there weren't any major instances during that time. Now, and since- for, for some, sorry to interrupt here, for sure. some clarity too, because I've been working a lot with Texas and local Texas DPS now does have the authority mm -hmm. to act. Now, local police in, in certain municipalities like Yuma, they can't do anything with a migrant. That is border pat patrol territory mm -hmm. jurisdiction. Am I wrong on that? Because even when we were walking through, there was a local police officer in a truck at a stoplight and, I, and he looks over and he looked at me and I go, yeah, you should probably tell CBP. And he goes, oh, they know. And I go, they're over maxed, right? And he was like, yeah. yeah. And I said, there's nothing you can do either. And he's like, no. And right. so they're locally, you guys kind of have your hands tied a little bit. Like the sheriff says, we got to call CBP when we encounter a group or encounter somebody. Right. And unless they're breaking a state law, we can engage, but it's a federal law, as you mentioned. And so we do have funding from the government that we've had for decades called Stone Garden funding that we can use our local law enforcement to help support a border patrol activity. But 
as far as arresting and processing, that all has to be done by a federal agent and not by local or state agencies. So uh, that is um, part of the reason why that there's that log jam when they get too many people in the system. Okay. Um, now, as a residual impact, are you seeing any COVID spikes, anything like that in Yuma, um, in its area? I know that we've, we're going to talk a little bit more about testing and things like that, but I know that that's kind of a, a flux thing, depending on where you are along the border as well. Right. So um, in talking to the nonprofit that actually does the testing of people that are released, uh, the, the infection rate's pretty low here um, for the migrants coming through. Okay. Not exactly sure why that's different than other areas. Um, but it hasn't really pushed that um, to extreme for our, for our hospital system. However, um, you know, if you bring through 20,000 people, there's still going to be an infection rate of, say, 5%. Well, that's still numbers that have to be addressed at some level that's not really in our normal uh, operation, especially with COVID. So this time of year for us, we have about an extra 100,000 people between winter visitors and our seasonal farm labor. So you bring them in already that are gonna increase our numbers. And now you're bringing in 20,000 a month um, of other uh, people from other countries that really aren't part of what's going on. Uh, and they do, they do add to that cumulative impact to the hospital, especially the, quite a few um, pregnant women coming through that are at eight months, nine months, some more than nine months it appears um, that then end up at the hospital um, taking obviously space to make sure that they have a healthy delivery. Mm -hmm. um, but that's resources that the community one um, can displace community members or people who, who are here year round. But two, the funding for those uh, individuals that receive medical care are only reimbursed by the federal government by a third. So the other two thirds get spread among the people who use the hospital and the, and the medical system here which rises, which increases our costs uh, as individuals. Mm -hmm. Something I don't think a lot of people take into account or think about. Um, now, we were talking a little bit about supplemental resources that they brought in. Do you know anything about any additional help that the uh, regional medical center has needed or has gotten over the last couple of months? So in the next few days, I understand there's about uh, 17 more medical professionals coming uh, to help with the, the onslaught of of just different things. I think, you know, we're COVID's on the rise. Uh, some of the fatalities are on the rise related to COVID. So um, having like most areas in the country, uh, the staffing is usually the problem. It's not the space. And so we're going to have a little bit of relief uh, coming from them. Um, and that's pretty much it. However, Border Patrol, they have to stay with whoever is admitted. So if they are in Border Patrol care, and um, they have to go to the hospital for whatever reason, and agents assigned to that person. So that takes another person off the line, out of the processing area. Yeah, because the nursing staff, that's not their, they definitely did not sign up for that. They, no. they can't handle something like that. Interesting. No. That's obvious, but I didn't think about that either, that resources go there too. Right. Interesting. Um, now, do you feel like your medical center right now is able to do its job for the citizens of Yuma right now? You know, I, I talk regularly with uh, the, the CEO of the hospital and some of the staff. And, and at this point, we're good, um, especially with these other uh, medical professionals coming in. Uh, but it is a concern because the, the, the uh, levels are increasing. They're not decreasing. So uh, depending upon where COVID goes in the next uh, few weeks, uh, we could end up where we were with uh, in the middle of the pandemic with two strain of resources and look to see if we can't um, bring in either either bring in more resources or uh, utilize other hospitals in other communities. It sounds like you guys are being very proactive in Yuma versus being reactive, which is really what we saw happen in Del Rio. And to my understanding, the framework was kind of take what worked in Del Rio and kind of implement that in Yuma. We still saw a really big number come in and kind of be stagnant there. Um, is that something that you guys are working with? Did the um, CBP, did, is, is he the new chief, Magnus? Magnus is this, uh, the commissioner. Okay, because Ortiz commissioner. is the chief, correct? Uh, the local chief in Yuma is Clem. Okay. Um, I'm so not familiar with- Like Ortiz. sector area. Okay. Yes. So, so is there any conversations about that? I mean, 
was anything implemented or, I mean, how do you, how do you stop that from happening? Really? Well, I mean, you can't stop them in their tracks because if you could, then we would be there, right? right. Mexico <laughs> would be doing Mexico's job that, that would be stopping them in their tracks. Right. Right. So I, I know there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes with Mexico to try to get them to, to manage that, that flow better or to cut off the flow. Uh, but I'm not really aware of the details there, but as far as like it, replicating a, a Del Rio type environment, we've have put together emergency plans on what that would look like, potential sites um, and what different agency roles would be. Um, I've talked with the uh, assistant secretary uh, in DC with DHS about, you know, it took three days for resources to get to Del Rio. Mm -hmm. Well, what can we do to uh, pre-position so that should something happen, we cut it down from three days to a day or two days, something right. that gets us a little bit further ahead. So those things are in discussions um, and there it's constantly fluid because DHS is, you know, got to manage the whole border, not just Yuma. Mm -hmm. My concern at this point is just Yuma. So <laughs> right. And one of the kind of solutions there was they put a staging area for the National Guard to be. Mm -hmm in the Del Rio area because it can be deployed kind of easier to other areas along the border. So I wonder if that's something that they, you know, I mean, it's still 19 hours or something from Del Rio to where you guys are. So right. we need something a little closer so um, for that. Governor Ducey has committed and actually has placed a National Guard here uh, in the Yuma area to, to assist the Border Patrol in those non-law enforcement activities. Uh, so that's a force multiplier for them. It takes them uh, out of doing all the, the things that need to get done, but there, there isn't normal paid staff uh, within DHS to do. So, you know, the governor of Arizona is really attuned to it. He, he's been here several times. Um, he's in constant contact with us here locally. So um, we have those resources. However, you know, this is a federal issue. The state of Arizona, the community of Yuma shouldn't be bearing these costs it should be at a federal, federal level bearing these costs. So th that's something that's maybe a, a, a higher level discussion, but as far as having people on the border to help, uh, we've, we've had the National Guard, or we still do have the National Guard, and then uh, the state police, the Department, of Home, um, the Department of Public Safety was also surged here to help with the drug mm -hmm. issue uh, for a few weeks. And that was uh, a very fruitful uh, time for, uh, to interdict the, the drug activity, that's Border Patrol just doesn't have time to do. And you guys are seeing a big spike in fentanyl in the Yuma sector, to my knowledge. We, we are, and um, what's concerning, extra concerning about that is not just the spike, but how little time we as a, as a region have put into trying to address the drug, drug trafficking because of all the, the, the people trafficking, mm -hmm. um, that if we're getting a spike with little bit enforcement, if we increase that enforcement, how much is really coming through? Uh, that's that's a really big concern. Kids die all the time from accidental over overdose, um, and and you have to stop the flow of that too to to have an impact. Um, so there is definitely uh, a bigger issue that's kind of not at the surface because those that are bringing through the drugs are not stopping at border patrol they're trying to get around border patrol. And so they're harder to detect. Now you were saying that this isn't a, a state issue, obviously. Well, Texas kind of took matters into its own hands and has been doing their own thing, obviously. And Texas Governor Greg Abbott is building their version of a wall, right? With mm -hmm. funds that through the state and privately donated you know, funds. So now we know that President Biden is coming in and filling some gaps. Have yeah. you had any conversations about what the wall um, construction would look like in Arizona. I personally went to the end of Levy Road there by the uh, power plant and saw all of the scrap metal basically yeah, right. sitting there. Um, so what are those conversations like, or have you had any? Well, I've had them. I had them with the commissioner yesterday. I had them with the secretary of America's office uh, when we declared the emergency about trying to find ways to strategically plug the holes that... Um, would be the most effective. And uh, so there is a plan coming together. Um, I've given my input. I've, I know um, the sheriff has given his and 
uh, border patrols obviously they're the subject experts so they're they're talking about it too so um, i've not heard of a schedule but i'm fairly confident that there's been enough discussion and, and national announcement that um, it'll move forward which will be very key we have 52 gates that were never installed we have seven miles of of the wall system that were short and so uh, doing some of it's going to be challenging but um the ones that are, are easy to help stop the flow in certain areas or at least control how things and people are coming through would be very, very impactful for us. Okay. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you're kind of echoing what other law enforcement individuals that I've spoken with say it would be a tool uh, to help. And it's not going to fix. We all know that there's always going to be issues. Immigration is always going to happen. And that isn't an issue, but we want it ha to happen legally, right? Okay. And right. from what I've understood is they believe that the wall will allow people to be funneled into certain areas and not going right into the interior of Yuma or other communities like that. Right. So it's obviously not going to stop everybody, uh, but it is enough of a barrier to make it daunting, especially so we have a lot of families that come through Yuma. Mm -hmm. You're generally not going to try to scale a 30 foot wall uh, with your family. So, you know, there's that kind of deterrent, um, but it is fixing immigration, because when we fix legal immigration, uh, then that takes away the whole business of trafficking people and trying to get around the system. Um, but you can't fix immigration until you have a secure border. So it's this back and forth tug of war uh, that really needs to start with securing the border. So I was very happy to hear uh, this month that, that that's the direction uh, DHS is, is trying to go is is that way because and you've seen it um the border is actually the middle of the river you mm -hmm. can't put a wall in the middle of the river so as soon as they cross the midpoint of the river they're in the united states by united states law you have to deal with them some way or another you can't just push them back to the other side of the river and so. it's like they're literally on the side of the wall but it's in us it's weird the territory is very weird and then you have this sovereign land as well correct. right because the tribal land is there correct so then you guys have that where you can't put a fence or a wall. So that's another issue that you guys kind of have to deal with. Right. And, and I think, you know, um, there's a lot of different methods, a lot of different ways to address it. I think it's taking the time um, with our tribal partners that are great community partners uh, and just figuring out what works for them and, and what works for us. Because um, at the end of the day, we're all one community and we're all impacted by the same, same measures from healthcare to to the economy, to our nonprofits. It's not um, separate communities. We're, we're one community. So, you know, those kind of things just take take more time. So I don't know that we'll get to that level, uh, but definitely 52 gates are a lot of gates to, to be having holes. So. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I mean, if for people that have never been along the border wall in Yuma, Arizona, because many have not, right. it is all agricultural land. Mm -hmm. So are those are those farmers, are those agricultural lands impacted by what's happening at the border? Are we seeing an impact there? Because I know, I mean, how rich that is for your guys' community. That's, I mean, the main, a big framework of your community is agriculture. It's 70% of our economy. So yeah, it, it's what drives our, our economy. Uh, and so our, our agricultural um, companies here that, that farm all that land, they're world experts on, uh, world leaders on growing secure and healthy food. Um, so when we get people coming through that the area, it just requires them to be more diligent and it costs them more to have more people observe what's going on um, and, and more mitigation measures if there's anything that needs to get get taken care of. So it's, it's an impact from that level, mm -hmm. but um, the, uh, the ag community here takes a strong and very personal um, approach to to making sure that they're producing healthy food so um yes it's an issue and by being able to contain and kind of direct people we can mitigate that issue even more okay awesome now when it comes to what's going on with the community it's not a community health center but it it kind of is it's the community center for border health right isn't that right. what that regional kind of they yeah, do so a bunch of different work with the community based on their needs, but they, in, in 2019 is what I understand, they started also working with migrants in kind of an NGO space. Right. So talk to me a little bit about how they operate in Yuma and what that looks like for your city. 
Well, so they're actually in every almost every community in our county. And so they're Re Regional Center for Border Health. And in 2019, when we had the migrants coming through, uh, they provided the medical care. So when we had a shelter, we had a temporary shelter to help people transition out. Uh, they were there and provided great care to make sure that there wasn't spreading any sort of communicable diseases. And, and if someone had medical issues, that they uh, were the first people to help uh, get those results. So they've been building upon that. And when COVID happened, they really jumped in the middle and uh, made sure that uh, access to testing and access to, to uh, and, uh, vaccinations wasn't based upon uh, income level that you know everyone had the opportunity. And so earlier this year, when the releases started happening in our community, which is what the concern is, when Border Patrol's overtaxed, they have to release into the community. Um, I brought together the same group of people I brought together in 2019 to see what we could do. And because of COVID um, fears, frankly, that we didn't know what we were dealing, dealing with, but also the impact of COVID taking out our nonprofits from fundraising and, and volunteer base and all that, um, there just really wasn't a system to put together. So for two weeks, we didn't have a system. Well, then the Regional Center for Border Health joined with a couple other local partners and uh, now, and they've been doing this since uh, March, uh, they receive people directly from Border Patrol upon release. They test them for COVID. Uh, they quarantine if they're, if they're positive. Um, and then they help transport them to their ultimate destination. So to, a, to a, an airport in another community. So um, that prevents the need for housing, that prevents the, the other ancillary impacts where people don't have the resources they need. Uh, they, they have the ability to um, be safe mm -hmm. and, and kind of you know, work on the, the rest of the, the transportation. And we talked about that a little bit when when we were just kind of chatting before I pushed record that, you know, these these NGOs, what, what's their other op option to let them die, to let them walk with no direction, literally zero direction. They 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 don't speak English. So mm -hmm. just to walk and have, not, you know, it, that's not good either. And no. so but a lot of people look at NGOs and point their finger and say they're contributing in this human trafficking thing that we're seeing, right? But like you said, they're on U.S. soil right. once they get to that point. So what are, you, what are we supposed to do? Right. So the, the decision isn't for the NGO. The decision is for the federal government to fix it, right? Um, the NGO is just really being a reactionary. They don't, this is not a mission that, that they were created to address. Um, and to be frank, our community, you know, has a lot of NGOs that do some amazing work, but they're all focused upon the community that has a lot of needs uh, throughout our whole county. And so this is an added level of responsibility that um, they're not originally created for. I'm thankful that they're doing it. Um, it would be worse if people were having to camp out in the streets and forage for food. And we're already starting to get a little bit of that where people are, are trying to hide out in backyards and those kind of things in some of the rural areas. Um, so to prevent that, we have the NGOs. Now, to, to put, you know, our, our goal, I think, is as a nation is to take that mission off of the NGO by reducing the flow that we don't have that need. Mm -hmm. um, the NGOs are not looking to do that. It's a need that the community has, and they're fulfilling those needs. Um, so we really need to kind of take them out of that whole political discussion on are they helping or are they hurting because they're doing what they, they have to do for the humanitarian side, um, which believe me, it would be um, dramatically different if they were not in place. Mm -hmm. Now, I, we talked about all of these communities have different issues. When I was in Texas, we were in the Eagle Pass area, Brackettville mm -hmm. area, a lot of runners. We had a lot of people going through ranch lands and that's something they've had in the past, like five or six a year. Now they're dealing with five or six a day. And they're getting more emboldened, right? They're cutting water lines and they're showing up at houses. Are you guys seeing things like that in the Yuma sector as well? Or is it more focused on the wall crossing? Yeah, most of most of the activity, and I think most is about 95 to maybe even 99% of the activity are, are those that are coming across and looking to turn themselves in. And that's why we have a lot of family units. Um, the, the getaways are uh, definitely happening. Um, but there are much lower number here than in other parts of the border. Okay. Um, so 
that's the that's kind of the trade-off is in every different sections there's i think another another part of arizona it's almost the opposite where it's mostly about getaways and very few people turning themselves in. So, right. And that's, that's the problem, right? It's okay. Here's your fix. It's not necessarily going to be the fix in 30 miles. Right. And I mentioned that to the commissioner the other day when he was here. And I said, look, when, when you start talking policy and you, and you start trying to make improvements, um, invite people from the border, from the different sections of the border so that we could have input on what works for our community or what could work for our community uh, instead of trying to decide that in DC with no relevant connection um, except maybe you know some people who have ideas but they don't have any practical experience so um, I, he understood that especially coming from Arizona so we'll see how that how that moves forward but it's definitely uh, different dynamics and it, I think a lot of it has to do with the trafficking part the the uh, transnational criminal organizations that actually do the trafficking uh, because it's a business in Yuma County. Um, it's about a $15 million business a, a day. So oh. it's not something that's not a spigot that's going to get turned off very easily. Um, we there's need to, back. yeah, there's going to be a lot of pushback on the Mexican side from the cartels, not necessarily the Mexican government. Right. Um, but it's, it's not as simple as, you know, someone left yeah. a country three countries away and decided to find their way to Yuma. Nobody's finding their way to Yuma without some direction from uh, the, the traffickers that are making it happen. Right. Absolutely. And I've seen it firsthand and you even got people that are in the States giving them very clear direction. You know, it's, it's just, it's happening. Right. Um, now you mentioned when CBP does their releases in Yuma, is that something that you guys know about? Is it something you plan for? They give you a call and say, Hey, there's about to be 4,000 people in you like what does that look like if you sure. can explain a little bit so in, in February um, I was getting the calls from the border patrol chief we have we have a great relationship I always have with our local chiefs because um, well we rely upon each other a lot and his 800 agents are residents of our community they're not sent here like you know for three-year duties they they come here and they live here they're neighbors, their friends. Um, so we have a really strong relationship. So in, in February, uh, he let me know that it was a potential that it was going to happen. And uh, roughly what the numbers were each day as they were coming through. Um, right now, what's happening is they're doing that same activity, but they're working directly with the NGO, with the Regional Center for Border Health. So people aren't being released to the streets. They're being released directly to where they're going to be able to get on a bus and get uh, to an airport. Okay. So, um, so it's just communicating, coordinating and executing yeah. that so that, and it's, you know, what's really unfortunate is you're hearing from just people talking because there's so much frustration surrounding this on, you right. know, on, on one side, there's more frustration, um, you know, but they see this situation, they automatically jump to those, the conclusions that this is, there's, corruption and there's all of this going on behind the scenes that we don't know about right mm -hmm. where it's you know they're like oh they made that disappear real quick well right. they're putting them on buses to get them out of yuma because otherwise they are going to be all over in yuma like and so is that the solution right so it's right like it's not necessarily a conspiracy that they got on buses but it's like follow the buses see where they're you know like right. people think there's going to be this big gotcha moment like you know, some lawmaker is going to be sitting there as they're getting off the bus, handing them gift cards. You know, that's what they think is happening right now. Exactly. And I'm learning what is really happening. And it's mind blowing every day. Yeah, it's one of those um, things that there's a lot of misunderstanding about. Um, yes, I will. I fully understand that uh, it is part of the plan when the transnational criminal criminal organizations put the plans in together. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. Don't like it. I don't think anybody in this country on either side of the issue would think that putting people through the difficult part of that travel, the, the abuse, the rape, the, um, ex, the exploitation, all that is something that we would agree to. Um, the problem is that to, to stop that, as it would be in any other country, if we saw these kind of abuses happening halfway around the world, we would be appalled. We'd be before the UN. We'd be doing all sorts of things. But for whatever reason, the narrative has overridden the common sense of why are we helping um, people being abused and, and being exploited? 
we should find ways to stop that flow. Mm -hmm. Help those people in their home countries or in other countries that can immediately have a positive impact on them and not end them up in indentured servitude, paying off a, a $7,000 to $15,000 debt. Mm -hmm. it's, it's insane. And until the federal government, that we can't do it. I can't change that flow. Um, the state can't do it. It has to be from Congress. It has to be. And until it actually is seriously addressed, this is going to be cyclical for for years and years and years i mean we had it two years ago and then before that we had it two years before that it's growing in size because people really believe that when they come across they're being invited and that they expect to have a check and they expect to have all these resources uh I've heard, you know I've heard it directly from them that that's what they're expecting they've been told they can do that Same. um that's uh, that's on us. That is on us. We're, we enabling, need, we're enabling country. it, right? Like it's it's a it's a vicious cycle, and we're we're part of that for sure. We are. So when someone's standing right before you, what do you do? I think you got to address the human need, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you stop them from standing right before you? You've got to stop it at the source, and so that's where the conversation needs to go, and that's really. Um, it's a great thing to campaign on, right? Um, but when was the last time we had a serious effort to try to address uh, that those elements that are causing this? Uh, I, it's been a while. It's been a, too long, in my opinion. So you obviously have your thoughts on what's going on in Yuma. You have taken matters into your own hands as far as you can. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you said, there's nothing that's gonna happen until Congress makes a move here. So, so what do you want from the Biden administration? I mean, you, you know, and, and for some perspective too, it happened two years ago, but we only hit about 980,000, I believe right now right. for last year, fiscal year to date, because these last two months don't count. Right. We were at 1.7 million. Right. Right. So, so we saw surges, but we've mm -hmm. never, I don't believe seen anything like what we're seeing right now. We're already at, I mean, we we're already at numbers from la like March when we saw the surge start happening in just two months, right. you know, and so we're already there. And it's not stopping. Any law enforcement person I've talked to says it's not under control. Mm -hmm. This isn't stopping. So what do, what do you want the administration to do, Mayor? So just as an example, in 2019, uh, we had 5,700 people being released by Border Patrol in Yuma County. 5,700 people in three months. I declared the emergency then. The administration, actually President Trump, had me in the Oval Office for a one-on-one -on -one, on -one meeting with him and the Secretary of DHS. I left that meeting with additional resources and within months, there were policies put in place by the secretary that changed the dynamic and it, and it discouraged the flow. And it worked because in three months, the, we closed our shelter. We were done. The releases were done. Um, and then those, and then COVID came and that shoved the numbers even lower with Title 42. Um, but those policies were immediately re removed by this administration. And uh, even the, the remain in Mexico policy that the courts told them they had to reinstate isn't the same policy that was in place that was removed in January. Because you, there's, and there always has been like an allocation of, of slots every day. Um, but Yuma probably had about 50 slots a day in 2019. We have 10 now, 10 slots, is 1% of the number of people coming across. So it's, there needs to be policies thought out. There could be a whole myriad of, of other options, but something needs to change. And if we don't change it on our side, it's not gonna change on the other side. There's no, no initiative, there's no need to. Um, and so what I'm asking for the administration to do is to do that, do, do figure out some policies that are gonna impact this flow. If there are you know, people that truly need asylum, Let's talk to other countries. They're walking in a lot of times through three or four different countries or halfway around the world before they get here. There's other options. Let's work on those options. Mm -hmm. uh, let's work on how do we how do we make some minor modifications uh, to our policies to um, discourage people from making that horrific trip? Because I'll tell you, the people coming through today in Yuma, those families are not the dramatically poor people that I saw in 2019. Mm -hmm. They're coming through with some nice luggage, some nice clothes, cell phones, 
And so um, they're, I mean, they're walking in. It's an, yeah. it's an, to them. And like you said, it's, it's kind of an open door mm -hmm. policy. I mean, it's kind of open and that's what the conversations are that I've had with them. That's what conversations I've had with people that have friends in the States telling them right now is the easy time to come into the country. Yeah. And that's right. very much happening. And in Yuma, I was watching girls that looked like they were getting ready to go out, like go to a club. And I was like, these two young girls, you know, right. they just walked into the U.S. And but it's not, whose fault is it at that point? Right? right. If they get a shiny thing called the American dream mm -hmm. with, uh, with an open door, you're going to go, nah. I'm right. not doing it. Right. And again, there are some people, absolutely, this is a humanitarian issue. There are people I talked to in the caravan that were in Venezuela, that were police officers in Venezuela and were tried to be forced to work for the mafia when they said no, their entire family was basically threatened. You know, their lives were threatened. So they got them out of Venezuela and then went through the Darien Gap with kids and saw 14 bodies and saw the most horrific things in your life. And those are the people that you're like, they must be escaping something so horrific. Mm -hmm. They must be fleeing persecution. They must be seeking refuge, right? Right, right. That's not what we're seeing. Right. 90% of caravan I walked with, it was economic claims. They Correct. said, I just want to work. And I said, well, why wouldn't you work and live in Mexico? And they said, because it's not worth the wages for the work we have to do. Mm -hmm. And even a Cuban family said, we want the benefits of the U.S. Those migrants, those 80,000 that were stuck down in Tapachula said, they, Mexico didn't take care of us. Surely the U.S. will be different. Right. That is the that is the mentality. And who's to blame? And we want to blame the lawbreakers, right? We want right. to blame it on lawlessness. But they literally are like, but we're not hurting anybody. How is why is this wrong? We're coming over and we're self surrendering. How is that wrong? Right. We're well, not getting know, the message out. No, we're not. The messaging's been all wrong. And that's the first thing that could be done with the administration is to find a stronger way to message. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I firmly believe in immigration. There's people in my family um, that are first generation uh, that, that emigrated at, at 18. Um, it is what has always fed our country for its, its strength and everything from workforce to education to leadership. I love immigration, but it's gotta be done right. And it's gotta be done legal. And that's, that's the problem um, for those that want to skip the line. Um, it, it, it's a real, it's really frustrating to watch that happen because as I see other people who are already, you know, working hard and trying to gain their citizenship or at least their, their right to live in the United and work in the United States, um, doing it the right way, it's taking them years. And even for, longer now, because we know the yeah. systems are backlogged, right? We know they, that they can't even process much of anything so those right. people unfortunately aren't the loud ones or aren't the problematic one right they're going to be they're going to wait right right and and let's face it who who would you rather have as a fellow citizen someone who's willing to obey the law or someone who just thinks well i'm not hurting anybody i'm just going to do it anyway uh, i i would take the first one if i had a choice you know i i want to have the people who want to follow the law and work hard and, and be proud to be, you know, in this country, to be American. Um, definitely that's, that's where I'm going. And, and that's why I say immigration needs to get reformed, uh, not shut off. It needs to get reformed. There's a big, big difference. Right. The resources need to be there. The plan needs to be there. The communication mm -hmm. needs to be there. And all of those things are lacking right now and have been. Right. Um, I mean, it is a political football. There's no denying that. Um, and whether you agreed with the former administration or not, there were some policies in place that did help law enforcement along the border. That is something, you know, one side is not does not love to hear. But, okay. you know, we can't just the, the solution can't be worse than the problem. Right. You, right. you can't be putting people through this and incentivizing this mm -hmm. and having people dying and drowning in the Rio and putting their families through this to go through the Darien Gap. We need to be speaking with the UN and coming together and talking and right. making the messaging something that makes sense across the board. Because mm -hmm. there are certainly families that, that check off every box for claiming asylum under our congressional law. What is unfortunate is you got people bringing tiny horses on the plane, taking advantage of it, right? You've right. got a situation right now where you have people coming in saying, but I, I, I'm here and my kids are sick and I need a better life and I need this or I, I, there's no way I can make enough money for my family. And 
We care mm -hmm. about people, right? But those aren't by congressional law, those aren't asylum claims. Right. And they are being allowed as that right now. Right. Actually, and this is something that most people don't understand. When people come through and they're engaged by border patrol, they're not claiming asylum. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on, they don't do until, that for a couple months. Right. And not until they get through the processing where they're asked, do they have a credible fear of going back to their home country? Do they even that even is even a topic so um they're not all asylum seekers they are people who are looking to enter the country and that's the majority of them mm -hmm. uh, absolutely there are some that truly feel for their, fear for their lives and they shouldn't have to live in those conditions again i think the united states needs to take the lead on it but we need to be talking and working with asylum partners around the world so that the people don't have to travel to the United States uh, to make that work and to get the, the security they need. Um, economics is not an asylum claim. Uh, mm -hmm. Economics is a desire. I have no, no uh, ill will for someone who wants to better themselves and better their, their family, but mm -hmm. that's the, the, uh, the process is there for a reason and um, it just needs to be followed. Yeah. I mean, a lot of a lot of issues, but I mean, Secretary Mayorka said it himself, the immigration system is broken. You can't mm -hmm. deny that. What we've seen, though, since Del Rio has been things that have made it harder for Border Patrol to do their jobs and kind of easier to remain in our country um, under the current administration. So a lot to be done, it seems. Um, but what are you guys, anything on the docket for Yuma? What are you guys looking at this week? Um, I'm planning another trip to the border. I'm unsure if I'm coming to you or I'm going to Texas, but everyone's always, whenever they see me, they go, uh oh, something's wrong. So is anything <laughs> wrong that I need to be in Yuma for right now, Mayor? Uh, I think we've covered what's wrong um, going on right now. Um, Border Patrol locally is managing the situation well. Uh, they've got a little bit of additional resources that are helping them do that. Um, the, uh, the ICE or the Endeavors Hotel uh, has is closed down as of the end of this week, as of the, the last of the year. Uh, so that dynamic's changing and those resources are being repositioned to support Yuma uh, and that processing with the ERO side, which is a key part of the uh, process. Will that so, come back as needed? Is that an as needed kind of thing or the look on your face right there, you don't want it back? Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> we, we uh, actually were, um, yeah, we, we really don't want it back. Because that means uh, the numbers are are unmanageable again. Correct, correct. They were going to open up a second one here, and the community just said, you know, one's one's more than enough, and uh, that ended up not happening. Um, it's my understanding that the procurement for that contract is closed. There, there's no current procurement going on. There's no open uh, solicitation. So at this point, I think they're they're not coming back, in, at least in any short term term um yeah. you know you, you never really know uh how things are going which is why i always try to stay in contact but that the upside is the the ice agents the arrow agents that were engaged on all the hotels in arizona there was i think uh three or four of them um, are all being positioned to support yuma and the processing from yuma so um that should also help so i don't know that there's anything uh, um different today than mm -hmm than maybe a few weeks ago, um, but it could change over a weekend like we saw just a month ago. I know, that's the thing is it, it can change like that. So um, obviously we'll stay in contact. And if there's anything sure. that you guys need on your end, please reach out. When I'm back in Yuma, we'll hopefully sit down in person together and can walk along the wall and, and check out some of these things. And maybe, who knows, maybe the construction will be started again. That would be great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much, Mayor Nichols, for your time. Take Thank care you. of your lovely little city. It was it was certainly a joy to be there and it was very welcoming. So I appreciate you. Thank you very much. and appreciate that, the, the kind words. And we'll look forward to your return. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.